Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go, our scripture readings from Sirach 51, verses 13 through 17, and Matthew 19, verses 3 through 12. We hear in Sirach, And you saved me from destruction, and delivered me from the evil time. Again, and you saved me from destruction, and delivered me from the evil time. I think uh, in every generation we believe that our time is the most evil and we see things around us uh, which are very evil. Uh, before we kind of get into that, uh, it's important to define good and evil in relation to each other. Good and evil are not equal to each other. Uh, they do not balance each other out. There is not a yin-yang or a dualism uh, or something similar to what we see in Star Wars where they need each other uh, for existence. Uh, good does not need evil. Um, what's important about evil is understanding the definition that evil is a deprivation of good. Evil is where good is lacking. This is what St. Augustine tells us. And so in, in, that, uh, in regards to that, with evil there are two types of evil, and we do see this uh, evil, these two types of evil, in every generation. And I believe that every generation believes that uh, their generation, it's the worst. Um, so there are physical evils. Uh, physical evils uh, would include things like suffering, disease, uh, illness of any kind, natural disasters, things like that. And then there are moral evils. Moral evils is where sin comes in. Anytime there's a moral evil, that's what we would identify as sin. A moral evil is when we use our free will that God has given us. We actually misuse our free will, um, and this is a moral evil. So it's a sin, a misuse of free will. So when we pray this prayer, actually what we hear in Sirach, you saved me from destruction and delivered me from the evil time. It's only God that ultimately can deliver us from moral evils and help us through a formed conscience and through his divine revelation, help us to make the right choices so we don't fall into moral evils. And it's really only with God that can ultimately save us from the physical evils which we experience and, and help us really come to an understanding of the purpose of those physical evils. Um, you know, we need him to understand, okay, what is the purpose of my particular suffering, illness, disease, or disaster that is going through uh, that I'm going through right now, we see in the gospel that the Pharisees are going to uh, tempt. In one version, it says, "Test Jesus." Uh, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the time. They were the Jewish religious leaders. Mm -hmm. They knew the law very well, and um, and so they come up to Jesus, this rabbi, and they ask him a question. It says, "At that time." there came to Jesus some Pharisees testing him or tempting him. And this is the question they posed to him. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? Is it lawful for a man to put away his, his wife for any cause? And so they're testing him. They're tempting him. And what are they testing him to do? Well, they're, they're asking him to change a teaching that, is, uh, that he has put in place. Um, he is God. They, they probably don't understand that or know that, but they do know that he has a authority. They do know enough about him to know that he teaches with authority and that uh, plenty of people are already starting to gather with him. And, and, he, and they're probably familiar, I would imagine they're familiar with his teaching already on divorce and also on adultery. And so that's what they're asking him here particularly. What is your teaching on divorce? What is your teaching on adultery? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Um, and he answers the question by saying, going back to the intention of what God intended. What is the, what is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of man and woman coming together? He says, God made them male and female, and the two become one flesh. And so what God has brought together no one should put asunder. And this is his answer. So his answer is, no, it is not lawful. Now, they don't want to accept that answer. And so the Pharisees, um, I think anytime someone is faced with an answer that they don't like, um, they want a way out or they want a way around. And if they can't get a way out or a way around, they'll simply just ignore 
the teaching altogether. In the case of the Pharisees and Jesus Christ, they are face to face with Jesus Christ. They ask him the question and he gives them an answer they don't like. And so the first inclination that they have, which is a moral evil, is to try to find a way around this. And so they ask a following question to Jesus. They say, well, Moses allowed this. Well, you know, and they're trying to pit Jesus against Moses, uh, their, their religious hero. And Jesus replies to that. He says, Moses permitted this evil. Per, mor, Moses permitted this moral evil is basically what happened um, because of the hardness of your hearts. And so notice again the Pharisees. First, they want Jesus to change his teaching. Is there a way that Jesus would change his teaching on this? Um, and when he does not change his teaching, then they say, well, is there a way around this? And, and there is not a way around it. So the only other option for the Pharisees, which is the option they take, is to ignore it in their practical life and then show violence towards Jesus. A violence, a hatred that, would, um, want, that they would try to make others not follow him and ultimately a violence which would lead to his crucifixion. So this, this really in regards to moral evils of our time um, that we are asking God to uh, deliver us uh, from these moral evils of our time, we see the same pattern in our time. Christ taught specific things and he asked his church to teach specific things, giving his church the authority. When we, or anyone for that matter, do not agree with the, church, the teachings of Christ and his church, I think our first inclination is to say, is it possible, church, that you could change your teaching? Could you change your teaching on this thing that I'm having a hard time following or, or maybe I flat out disagree with? So one, could you change your teaching? When the, when the church says, no, we will not change our teaching, then I think the next thing that people do is they would say, well, is there a way around it? Is there a, um, a pastoral way around this? Is there a, a something that could apply to me, but maybe not to others? And you notice this is a hardening of heart. And God does, of course, sometimes allow this because of the hardness of our heart, and we fall into uh, horrible things. Of course, this is not what God would like. This is what he would allow, and allowed because of the hardness of our heart. And then I think third, finally, you know, is that people would show violence towards Christ and his church. Um, when there's no way that the church will change, and maybe perhaps no way around the, the burdensome, the, the, the cumbersomeness of the teaching that I don't like it, then I show violence, lashing out against Christ and his church. And this is what Christ experienced, and this is what Christ said that the follow, his followers would experience. And so we have to um, really evaluate, okay, well, what are the moral evils in our time? What does Jesus Christ teach um, about how we can be delivered from those moral evils and saved from the destruction, which is a consequence of those moral evils? Thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. And please check out uh, our Beanwell coffee. We roast our own coffee. Check that out, as well as the oratory prayer resources, a prayer book, prayer cards, and chant CD, Remnants Divine Mercy Chaplet, and Link to Liturgy, which offers fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.